Chopin wrote some fabulous waltzes. And whilst his A-flat waltz might be at the easier end of the spectrum, it's no less beautiful. So today I'd like to present a little tutorial on how you might go about approaching it and a few tips if there is the odd part of it that you find a little too difficult just at the moment. Are you sitting comfortably? Then let's begin. Hi, this is Tommy with Tommy's Piano Corner. The place for returning pianists, or indeed anybody who loves piano, to share tips and ideas of how to get the best from this great hobby. If it is your first trip here, then please do think about subscribing. Simply hit the little icon in the bottom right hand corner of your screen now, and it's all done for you. As I said, Chopin's A-flat waltz, also known as the Farewell Waltz, is one of those that's at the easier end of the spectrum. In fact, Henley have classified it as a level 5, so that's smack bang in the middle of intermediate. Now, there are three versions of this waltz that I've heard of, and the one that I grew up with was the Fontana version, which in fact was published after Chopin's death. But then I remember a few years ago listening to a recording of Rubinstein playing this, and I'm thinking, why is he not following the music? So I did a little research and discovered in actual fact it's because he was probably using a completely different version altogether. So I carried on Googling to try and find the version that he was using and I found one called the Autograph Vassauvian, which is the closest I've found to what he plays. It's not note for note and maybe that's because he has a slightly different version or maybe he just chooses not to play note for note what was written in that particular version. Now, these versions of Fontana and the Autograph of Sylvia are very similar, as you might imagine. And in actual fact, this tutorial will apply equally easily for, to either version. So by all means, definitely spend some time listening to a few pianists and decide which version you prefer. One thing I would say for the Autograph Varsovian version is that it's a full 20 measures shorter than the Fontana version, and that's before you add the repeats that the Fontana version has. So if you're playing it for friends, it's probably in the better ballpark of what people will listen to without starting to get distracted if you follow my drift. Also, I think that the Fioritura and the ornaments in the Autograph Varsovian version are maybe a little bit less complicated than those in the Fontana version. But I mean, that in itself is not really a reason to choose one over the other, I wouldn't have thought. The demonstrations that I'll give in this tutorial, I'll take from the Autograph Varsovian version for want of something better. And it, in fact, it's newer to me, so it's a little more interesting for me to work from that version anyway. In terms of the tempo of this piece, when you listen, you'll hear wildly differing versions from different pianists. So I would let yourself be guided by how you feel this particular waltz. Now, I find it relatively slow, though I have heard, you know, pianists play it much slower than me. In terms of its structure, there are basically three themes that you get. There's the first theme that recurs throughout the waltz itself. And this is then interspersed with a second theme. And then a third theme. One thing that I've noticed is that many pianists seem to mix and match what they want to play with this, unless, of course, there are versions of it available that I've never heard of. In terms of ornamentation, there are a few grace notes. There's a turn that recurs a few times. There are these little fioritura, and you know, they're basically chromatic runs with a few notes on the end. In the Fontana version, there's one that finishes with a two octave arpeggio, but they're not massively complicated. And to be honest, if you do find them a little tricky for now, then why not simply use the simpler version of them until you can manage the others? So let's start off perhaps by looking at the Fioritura themselves, because these are likely to be the biggest technical difficulty altogether with this piece. 
These appear in bars 11, 27, 59, and 107. With the one in bar 27, I think, being the trickiest. Starting with the one in bar 11, which actually reappears in bars 59 and 107, and looking closely, it's basically a turn around A natural with a few notes tagged onto the end. Chopin writes this out as eight sixteenth notes over a beat and a half. However, I think with Chopin, these are really not intended to be played strictly in time. Some pianists, including Rubenstein, will take their time over these, where others will play them much faster. Now to practice this, I'd start by using rhythms. First a simple dotted rhythm, then two fast, one slow, then three fast, one slow, then four fast, one slow. You could opt to practice just the right hand alone first if this is one of the first times you've attempted this type of Chopin-esque touch. Now let's look at the trickier one in bar 27. It's worth taking a little time here to decide what fingering we might want to use. These same notes appear in each version that I've seen and so you can investigate different fingering options. One that I found works surprisingly comfortable at the top of the run is the idea of playing four over three. Now this looks counterintuitive, I know, but in reality works very well and is apparently something Chopin frequently recommended. Alternatively, just play each note from one to five. For the first part of it, you might adopt a simple standard chromatic scale fingering. Alternatively, you could finger it more like a turn. I've usually opted for this fingering. This I would practice in a similar way to the first. However, given it's a little longer, we have more options around working through it. When practicing in groups of three, for example, we can start the group on the first note, then on the second note, and then on the third. When practicing in groups of four, we can do similarly. We can start on the first note, then the second, then the third, and then the fourth. When I practiced this, I also carried on in groups of five, six, and even seven sometimes. And again, starting on different notes each time. Again, working on the right hand alone might be useful. However, do start putting both hands together as early on in the learning process as you can. By all means, you may synchronize your hands in initial practice with the left and right hands playing together on the seventh little note in the run. Later on, you may choose to play perhaps the first few notes faster in the right hand and then slow down towards the top, or indeed do the opposite. That way, the hands will no longer be all the time synchronized, but they don't need to be. Equally, don't be afraid to take your time with this. I've seen a recording of Kissin play this, and he really is in no rush to play it. In terms then of the remaining ornaments, I think that little turn in bar seven could cause a problem. I mean, it is after all followed immediately by a grace note on the same E flat. So if you do find that this is too tricky to pull off, remember that in the Fontana version, it's much simpler. He simply uses a grace note. So play it like that if that's what you need. Otherwise, for the remaining grace notes, I don't think these will cause you any issues. I mean, I prefer to play them a little bit before the beats, but you may prefer to play them on the beats. Now let's look at the rest. As I said, the Autograph Varsovian version has 108 bars. However, when we look closely, bars 1 to 16 are repeated in bars 17 to 32. We then have 33 to 48, which are the second section, and then 49 to 64 are again the same as bars 1 to 16. Even then within bars 65 to 97, bars 89 to 97 are repeated materially anyway. 
We then simply have the main theme again until the end. So all in all, less than 60 bars of different material to learn. I'd be inclined to practice this hands together, nice and slowly and in short segments. Start with the first theme in segments of just two bars, for example. Given this recurs several times within the piece, I believe that making it feel comfortable means we will always be going to something that we feel we know very well. And this is a little psychological trick, I guess. Aim to bring each segment up to speed before you move on. Then, as these start to come together, extend them into sections of four bars, and then into sections of eight, for example. I would then work on the third theme in the same way. And remember, this has got the sort of climax of the piece, if you like, because it has the fortissimo here. But of course, it's not to be played like a Rachmaninoff fortissimo, okay? It's, a, it's all things are relative, I think, within music. In terms of the interpretation, I'd be inclined to remember that he wrote this as a farewell to his then fiance. And that gives it a sort of melancholic feel to me anyway. And okay, yes, there are some brighter episodes in it, but it comes back to this same melancholic theme. So perhaps parting is such sweet sorrow was on his mind when he wrote this. Also, given that there's such a lot of repeated material as we looked at earlier, then really we need to think about mixing it up a little to add interest. Now, to me, Horowitz was excellent at this kind of thing. And in fact, sometimes he would even do the opposite of what the composer wrote in the score. So, for example, there might be a ritardando and he'd speed up. There might be a diminuendo and he'd get louder. And to me, this was him thinking perhaps, well, the composer wanted a change in dynamic or a change in tempo, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. He just did the opposite of what was written. Also, always look for inner voices you can bring out. For me, in the first theme, where we have the chromatically descending top notes of the chords, this can be emphasised to add interest. Also, if you take bars 65 to 79, for example, note the downward stem and slur marking between the D flat and the C. This means that not only should you bring them out as a mini phrase, you could also do this quite strongly if you wanted to. Also, pay particular attention to the slurs elsewhere. Here, for example, we have a slur from the bass note to the top note of the chord. So I'll bring out the top note of that chord. Equally, here we have a set of notes with downward pointing stems. So these clearly are a separate voice, and then we can bring this out to our taste. Also look here at where we have both a stress mark on the second beat of the bar, plus a slur from this beat to the first beat of the next bar. So here you might want to completely ignore these pedal markings and make more of this phrasing. With Chopin, I think there are always tons of tiny little details in the score that we can take advantage of to give our own interpretation to the piece while still sticking with his original intentions. I hope this then has given you enough to get you motivated to learn this lovely little waltz. And don't forget, if the ornamentation is a little on the tricky side for you for now, then use the simpler version as I've suggested in this video. Of course, being Chopin, not only is this an exquisite little waltz, but it's a great piece to play for family and friends. Let me know how you get on with it in the comments below. If you're not already, then don't forget to subscribe to Tommy's Piano Corner. Click that little bell icon so you're notified of new videos as and when they're released. I do thank you very much for watching today and look forward to seeing you very soon.